Just shake hands with a few people around you and welcome them one more time to the house of the Lord before you're seated. <clears throat> what can we render unto the Lord for all of these benefits? When we look around, David, uh, David, when he paused in this writing, I, I don't know how long there was between verse 12 or verse 13. I don't know how long he had to sit and think about the answer to his own question or how long he had to ponder what he had just proposed to the people. But I, I think it was probably a little while. And he began to mentally list out the goodness that God had brought to his life. And I'm sure that he, at the end of that question, could say, God, you know whether... I was in the palace or I was in the pasture. You've been good. God, whether I was up or whether I was down, you were good. Whether I was living under the condemnation of Nathan or the anointing oil of Samuel, in every situation I found that you have been good. Whether it was the bear or the lion or Goliath that was standing in the way between me and victory, you stepped in and brought it, God, because you're good. And I think that as we just pause in our lives sometimes and we begin to think about the goodness of God. I mean, right here, right now, this morning, in Thanksgiving Sunday, if we pause for a few moments and we begin to think about what God has done, maybe you're brand new to faith, maybe you're brand new to living for God, maybe this is a brand new idea, but even you, if you look back over your life, you can see how God has acted, how God has created a way in the middle of no way, because that's the God that we serve this morning. And if you have lived with God for just a few weeks, a few months, a few years, you know that God intervenes. You know that God acts. You know what it's like to call on the name of the Lord and God respond. You know what it's like that when there's a sickness, how you begin to pray. And God moves in the midst of that circumstance and turns it around. We know. And then we've got some people that have lived for God their whole lives in the room this morning. And their experience of years would tell us that God is faithful. And above all, God is good. And the one thing that God would ask of us is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I mean, sometimes we just really need to take a look around. Take stock of what's happened in our life. Take stock of what's happening. When you begin to add up the benefits, you can see that God has been good. We all, you know, I, I think the Bible instructs us to be thankful because it's human nature to focus on the negative ledger in life. It's human nature for us to, to look at what's not right in the midst of what's not wrong. It's, you know, it's a simple, let me give you a simple example. If we had left a big barrel of stinky trash in the foyer, everybody that came in this morning would have noticed it. You would have. But if someone had come in at 9 o'clock, like Pastor Matt, and took the trash out, nobody would notice it. There wouldn't even be any element of th thankfulness because you hadn't realized what's been done. And sometimes in our human finite minds, we forget what God has done. And we have to pause and remember. And we have to step back to the place in our life where there's a barrel of garbage there. We've got to step back in our life to the situations where God hadn't yet intervened. We've got to remind ourselves of the goodness of God, how there were some things that weren't right that God brought right. Now, this morning, things are pretty good. We've got our suits on. We smell good. You guys look good. Look at your neighbor and say, man, you look great this morning. If it's appropriate. But we could take you back to some places just a few months ago or maybe a few years ago, a decade or so ago, where things weren't as nice as they were this morning, where things weren't as clear cut as they were today, where somebody on a Sunday morning 10 years ago, maybe they would have been stumbling out from under a circumstance that they had no idea what they did last night. It was just a weekend to party. It was just a weekend to get drunk. It was just a weekend to experience some things in life and, and, and that they, they would regret for the rest of their lives. But this morning, God has turned that all around. God has intervened, and God has acted, and God has moved. And just as I'm glancing around the room this morning, I know some situations where God has acted and where God has moved, and we're a different people today than we were 10 years ago because of the goodness of God. And we've just got to ask ourselves sometimes, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his goodness to me? How can I give him thanks? How can I give him praise? The psalmist said, I will render unto the Lord a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I'm going to give it to him. 
I mean, we've got to give him that, don't we? we just got to offer him a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Luke chapter 17 speaks about a group of individuals Jesus meets. Verse 12 says, And as he, Jesus, entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You see, all of them were lepers now. They may have been law doctors. They may have been lawyers, fishermen, carpenters, laborers, farmers. But now they're all lumped into the same group. The scripture just simply says, lepers. Throughout scripture, there's always been a strong parallel between sin and leprosy. When God wanted to find a disease that represented the most dangerous thing to a Christian, he chose leprosy. In the Old Testament, leprosy was a separator. It created division like nothing else. It separated you from the house of God and the man of God. It separated you from your family and friends, and it left you on the outside. It marked you and required you to admit you were unclean. Not only that, but anyone that touched you, came near you, was with you, proximity of you, they were unclean as well. Just like sin. You see, sin will always bring you, sink you to the lowest level. And here were these ten men, leprosy, had consumed whatever it was that they were. Current medical terminology for this disease is Hansen's disease. It creates a numbness in the body. An inability to sense, touch, feel. And people become physically handicapped. You see, like sin, sin will create a hardness in your heart. It will leave you spiritually disabled. You see, leprosy may have brought social shunning. But, le but sin brings something much worse. It spiritually separates you from God. And in our text, these men, they remain nameless in Scripture and hopeless in their situation. We, we don't know their backstory. I don't know that it really matters who they were anymore. It only matters what they had become, and that was the ten lepers. And somehow in their lowest state, they found a sense of community. Each one of them had nine new companions that maybe had nothing connected before, but now they were lepers. We don't know anything about the families that they left behind. Maybe the dad of a newborn. Maybe they were children, perhaps adolescents only. Perhaps they were businessmen or grandfathers. Maybe they were, uh, who knows what stock in life they had. But now they're lumped under one group, lepers. Unspeakable losses, horrible circumstances. And they're left to cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. The catalog of what they had collectively lost was massive. They lost their past, their present, and their future. And they're only left with a meager existence for now until they die. You see, this disease brought death slowly, sometimes living between five to ten years when the symptoms represented themselves. It slowly worked its grisly end in their lives. They knew that there was no cure, no hope, and no medicine that they could get. And so when they heard about Jesus, and when they saw Jesus, when they came together, I don't know if they traveled in a group regularly or if they traveled independently mostly. You know, it's my experience that most beggars travel alone so they can get whatever they get for themselves. But these gentlemen gathered together. They brought their cause corporately. And when they saw Jesus, the Bible says they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Wow. It was likely that they had already been to the priest. He had already executed judgment, unclean, separate yourselves. He had already separated them from the people. The condemnation was clear. And that's why they were here in this hopeless situation. But what they feel, failed to realize initially was that the master had granted them the mercy that they had requested. That was their cry. Master, have mercy on us. Master, have mercy 
on us. And I, I don't know if that just kind of parallels into somebody's life this morning, but if you came and there's only one thing that you can cry today, I'd encourage you to cry that to the Lord because every single one of us are in a place where we need God's mercy to intervene, where we need God's mercy to act and God's mercy to reach us. Initially, they failed to realize that the master had already granted their request. But can I just remind everybody before we go any further in the message, no one is beyond the reach of God's mercy this morning. No one is beyond God's reach of his great mercy here today. And if you came into the room, I don't know why you came. Maybe you came at the invitation of someone. Maybe you came by your own uh, volition. Maybe you came by your own plans and purposes. Maybe you came because you knew there was turkey dinner right after this. At home somewhere, not here. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I might be able to buy you chicken dinner at Dixie Lee. Two for 620. Throw a little gravy in there. Hey, you look pretty sober this morning. I don't know why we've all come to the room this morning. But this is what I know. We can leave different than the way that we came. We can leave a different group of people than the people that came in this room today. We can leave people that have been touched by God's power. And maybe even initially you don't realize. But if you've cried out for God's mercy, can I tell you that there isn't anything that God inclines his ear to more than a cry for mercy? There's something about it when someone begins to cry out for God's mercy. He hears and he responds. He answers quickly when someone begins to cry out for mercy this morning. When you begin to, to realize your circumstance and when you begin to realize your circumstance, there's hopelessness attached to it. There's sin attached to it. You see, when we realize we've got no hope on our own, we recognize the need for the mercy of God this morning. And when we cry out with that need for mercy, you never know what's going to happen. Initially, they didn't realize what God had done. They were all impossibilities, but God stepped in. They were all imperfect, but God stepped in. No wonder the psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But before there's dwelling in the house of God, there's the opportunity for God to extend his mercy and his goodness into our lives. And that is available right here this morning. Everybody in the room were lepers at one point. But God's made a way in the middle of no way for many of us. So if you're here this morning and all you can think about is there's no hope for me. If your cry is just for mercy, the master is here and mercy is available. You see, as those fellows walked along, they began to feel the gravel in their sandals. What was numb now became sensitive to what was happening. Their fingertips began to feel once again. Their face, the warmth of the sunshine, the breeze blowing. They hadn't sensed that for years maybe perhaps decades, maybe it had been so long since they even had that sensation. They began to, it, it was hurtful at first, it was painful. But then they began to realize one by one, I, I don't know how they responded to healing like that. I, I don't know if they began to cry. I don't know if they began to shout. I don't know if they began to pat one another on the back. I, I don't know. We have to let our imagination run a little rampant today. We've got to just kind of think, what would it be like if you had a death sentence attached, hopelessness, where you slowly died, but it in immediately got turned around. What would you do? How would you respond? How would you act when God turned it around? I, I have a, an idea this morning that, that some people would be shouting. I, I have an idea that some people would be rejoicing. I, I think some people would begin to, to celebrate. I think they'd be dancing the two-step. Or I think some people would be hopping and jumping, leaping for joy, saying, I can't believe it. I haven't been able to do it. I think some people would act just a little bit excited today. I think that if, if there was a, just a, just that realization that gripped them. I've been healed. My life has been changed. I, I, I don't have that same, that same numbness any longer. I don't have that same hopelessness attached to me anymore. I think that that causes celebration. 
I think that's what happens. I think it creates thankfulness. And uh, no doubt there was jobs on the to-do to -do list to do. They had already been given the command, go show yourselves to the priests. There was a list of things that began to happen, I'm sure, in the midst of their celebration, in the midst of their joy. They, they begin to immediately put all the dots together, begin to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and the picture came clear. I can go home. I can go back to my family. I can go back to my job. I've got a future. I've got hope. And as they begin to think through all the ramifications of what God just did in their lives, they had a lot to do. They had to get to the priest. They had to get home. Their to-do list grew from just sitting and begging to living life abundantly. And that's the danger that we all sit in this morning. Because as God changes our lives, we're all lepers. Remember, we all were lepers. But now that God's intervened and God's touched, things have changed. You see, where we didn't have anything to do before, now we've got lots to do. It's responsibility. It's the redemptive lift that God's bring, God brings into our lives where for some of us, there wasn't a job before because we were living outside of grace. We couldn't hold a job if we tried. But since God changed things around, now we've got a lot to do. I don't know if this is getting close to home yet or not. Let, 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 me, get, let me get down to where we're living. We, we've got a lot to do. We've got jobs that take our time. But none of us, some of us, wouldn't have any job if it wasn't for the redemption of God in our lives. Can I just tell you, if it wasn't for God's goodness, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be thankful. We didn't have the opportunity to have a job. But God stepped in and turned things around, and now we're, we're doing all right. You see, the danger is that we begin to think that we got where we are by ourselves when it was only by the mercy and the grace of God. And what God is asking some people, we, you know, literally, we've got to set a day aside to remind ourselves to be thankful about what God has done in our lives. We've got to set a day aside and say, now, this is the day of Thanksgiving. So for one day a year, I'm getting a little heavy. I've got to back off. One day a year, we're going to set that aside to be thankful and grateful. Folks, if we can embrace Thanksgiving in the unexpected seasons, in the unexpected times, there's something that gets released to us that God wants to give to us. There's something that God wants us to have. You see, there could have been an instantaneous miracle. Jesus did it. He could do it, but he didn't do it in this situation. He, ten lepers wandered away thinking they were the same as they ought, had always been. Ten lepers walked the roadway, whining and groaning and complaining. I wish he could have. I wish he did. I, no, no. I, that's, my, that's Jack's negative assumption. But all of a sudden, when they begin to realize the goodness of God, what he had done, they carried on their merry way, except for one person. And I don't know if that's showing us the odds that it's about 10% of the people that become truly grateful for what God has done in their lives. But this one guy, all of a sudden, he realized, my future just changed. My hope just got greater. My plans just got adjusted by the goodness and the grace of God. So I can't continue on this way. You see, it was a test. Jesus could have instantly healed them. It could have been miraculous. In a moment, it could have been done. But the test was, I'm going to let progressive healing happen. And let's see who comes back to give me thanks. I'm going to let progressive blessing happen. And let's see who brings back thanks. I'm going to let progressive goodness happen in their life. And let's see who comes back to give me glory and give me praise. And maybe it wasn't instant the way that God intervened in your life. He's just progressively began to let you come step by step by step. But can I remind us, right now is the right time to be thankful. Right now is the right time to give thanksgiving. Right now is the right time to give God glory and honor and praise and blessing. They all began to celebrate, but one returned. Luke 17 said, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Where are the nine this morning? 
I, I, maybe I'm just an echo, a reminder of God's goodness in your life. But I, I'd like you to think for a few moments of where you'd be without the goodness of God. Because unless we ever come to the reality that God has been good and we offer him thanks, then we are in the category of the nine. Where are the nine this morning? Are you grateful for the goodness of God? Speaking to the nine this morning, God's brought healing and hope, but he's waiting for your thankfulness. You wouldn't have what you'd have if God hadn't intervened. But this morning, I'm asking, could you offer him a sacrifice of thanksgiving today? Would you take some time and remember what God has done and remember what God still has left to do? But in the midst of our activity, in the midst of our to-do list, in the midst of everything good that we've got going on, we just need to pause and give God thanks for his goodness and his great grace in our lives. And maybe right now is the right time to do that. Maybe right here in this room today, someone just wants to pause. Maybe the word is just kind of working its way into our lives. And we just need to lift our voice and say, God, you've been good. I've got to pause for a moment and thank you. I've got to pause for a minute and give you praise. God, he's been good. Oh, God, you've been good. He said, there were not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. That's what Jesus said, the one that returned, this Samaritan. This Samaritan had an attitude of gratitude. Where are the nine? They're busy this morning. Full agenda. Calendar full. But this one loud Samaritan. Scripture says with a loud voice. If you're wondering why, why we have a PA system. And we're still learning how to pull the mic away when we get loud. It's because we have instances in Scripture where just loud seems to work. God can hear us. He's not deaf. But loud seems to work for him. When we abandon our self-dignity and we release it to gratitude and thanks to God, there is a sacrifice involved in that, something that honors him. That blesses him. This one loud Samaritan, Scripture says with a loud voice. Sir, I hope that loud worship doesn't offend anybody. I hope that it's not offensive. You see, here's the challenge I have is that the Scripture said that all ten were loud earlier. It says they all lifted up their voice when Jesus was afar off. I, I have noticed that when it's people in need, we have loud voices. We've got loud voices when we acknowledge need in our lives. We've got loud voices then. But when it comes time for thankfulness, we're very modest. I prefer, <laughs> I better not get on that. All the loud people want me to preach it. <laughs> I think we can all agree that there is something extravagant about worship that isn't, I mean, there, there's time for, for silent worship. I worked in secular workplaces. I mean, even here, it's not like we're running run around the office going, Woo! Glory! I haven't heard Matt shout that in a little while. I... We probably come out of the office, look a little funny, but but when we're gathered together corporately, there's something about worshiping God with our whole heart. And when I get my heart full, my mouth gets full of praise. It gets a little bit loud. It gets a little bit. That's not me by nature. I'm an introvert made extrovert by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's that's me. That's who I am. That's that's what it, that's what happens when you just let God on the inside. I, I, I one day I was thinking the God of that created the universe came inside my life. That can't be kept quiet. You've got to let praise out when God gets on the inside. You've got to let it out. Where are the nine? Where are the nine this morning? It was only moments ago when they all lifted their voice, crying for mercy, but now they've become silent in a time of thankfulness and praise. Well, this seems like a bit of a heavy message for 
thanksgiving, not intended to be. You see, we have a responsibility, not just this long weekend in October to be thankful for what God has done, but we have an attitude of gratitude that needs to be embraced. And God's question, Jesus is asking this morning, where are the nine? Where are the nine today? Where are the nine who have touched, the nine who I've changed, the nine who now have a future, who now have hope? They've now got jobs. They've got help. They've got family. They've got futures. Where are the nine this morning? Are there any of the nine here today? Any of the nine in the room? Any of the nine that say, I'm going to be one that turns and gives God praise. I'm going to be one that, that makes my mind up. An attitude of thanksgiving is what I have. It's Thanksgiving Sunday, but for the rest of the year, 52 Sundays from now, I'll be able to say, I changed the way that I, I worshipped. I changed the way that I did some things. I, I, I embraced an attitude of thanksgiving and incorporated not just into one Sunday a year, but every day of the week, every week of the year, I became a worshiper. I became someone that offers God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. We can come back to the music this morning. You see, it was the Samaritan. The scripture refers to them in contrast to the Jews frequently. The story of the good Samaritan by the very title would indicate that his goodness set him apart from what Jews would be considered normal behavior by the bad Samaritans. We have the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman who left her water pot and brought her whole city. It was the unexpected, unanticipated individuals sometimes that set the bar and the example for all of us. Among the ten lepers, we have this one fellow. I don't know if they were all Samaritans. The Bible says that Jesus was between Samaria. Some maybe were and some maybe weren't, but we know that he was. Perhaps he knew that the reception he'd receive from the priest wouldn't be a welcome one, so he chose Jesus instead. I don't know. I do know that Jesus was swinging a door open. The New Testament church was going to embrace them. Missionary journeys would be sent. But in order to become a part of what Jesus wanted to do, without question, thanksgiving was required. And so I'm closing, but allow me to leave you with these few scriptures. You know, what is the sacrifice of thanksgiving? What is that? The scripture refers to it. In our text, we read about it. Also find it in Psalms 107. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Psalm 95, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Psalm 69, verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock. In Psalms 100, maybe the most familiar of all Bible passages on Thanksgiving, says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Thanksgiving. It was an Old Testament concept, sacrifice, the Old Testament concept brought into the New Testament in our church by attitudes and activity of worship. Hosea 14 2 says, take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. And then there's this little phrase. He said, so we will render the calves of our lips. The word calves here represents our lips, our words. The full meaning of this phrase in Hebrew is we will offer Young bullocks, even our lips. We will now. God's not. He's talking about what we speak. He's talking about what we say. He's talking about what we declare it becomes a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Our offering of thanksgiving is to be made by the fruit of our lips. 
what we speak, what we say, our voices. We're requesting God for his presence to come amongst us. We're declaring his greatness to all around us. God can do anything here this morning. That's what happens when we begin to offer a sacrifice of praise. Not only does it impact us, not only does it fresh, bring refreshing into our lives, but it lets everybody around us know what God is able to do. The fruit of our lips is gratitude and thanks. In closing, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. I won't read it all, but we know the story. Jonah's running from God. He's fleeing to Tarsus and God's mandate and call is on his life, but he's refusing it. He's running away. He's in a ship and a storm comes up. They're caused to throw him overboard. The Bible says the fish came and swallowed Jonah. What do you do when a fish swallows you? Pray. So maybe the no-brainer verse here is, then Jonah prayed. (laughs) I mean, what do you do? You just get swallowed by a fish, folks. Google. We don't know if it was a whale or not. What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You begin to pray. You begin to pray to God for deliverance. You begin to pray that God... But listen to Jonah's prayer. He said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardst my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the flood compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. I'm out of your sight, God, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Jonah had a few things right. He had a lot wrong, but he had a few things right. He knew what to do in the worst situation. He began to cry out to God. He began to acknowledge God on the throne. He began to acknowledge who God was. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Verse 9. This is, this is what's amazing. In the belly of the fish, Jesus said, or Jonah said, but I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. Wow. That same idea, that same mentality of sacrifice we find in Jonah in the belly of the whale, in the worst possible situation. See, the sermon's almost finished. But for some of you, the circumstance is still the same that you're aware of right now as it was last week, last night, last few moments. So what do you do when things aren't right? What do you do? Jonah said, I was in the bars of the deep. I was down to the lowest of the low. But in that lowest state, you can't get any lower than Jonah was. World's first submarine dive. He goes down to the bottom, not of the earth, but the ocean. The lowest of the low. What do you do when you're in the lowest of the low? The Bible says, this is what he did. I'll offer sacrifice unto thee, what? With the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Man, Jonah, you got it right. The worst of the worst, but you've got an attitude of thanksgiving. And Jonah declares to the nine, this is what you need to do, guys. You have to have an attitude, a voice of thanksgiving. Verse 10 says, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Immediately, when Jonah embraced an attitude of thanksgiving, God turned his situation completely around. I love that. I love it. 
I love it because it tells me that no matter what we're walking through, Thanksgiving is always in order. I, I love it because no matter how dark the night gets, how difficult the circumstance is, if we can just embrace an attitude of Thanksgiving, God will turn the situation around. If we'll just embrace Thanksgiving, it changes everything. That's the power of a day like today. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on the goodness of God. And it gives us a chance to call out to God with a voice of thanksgiving, regardless of what happens around us. And in that moment, God can turn it around. That's the God that we serve this morning. And God can deliver us the same way that he delivered Jonah. He can deliver you today. Standing together with me. Jonah got out of the pit because he passed the test. His soul fainted within him, but he remembered the Lord. I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. He didn't get some prophetic word. I mean, he had already had a call on his life. He was refusing it, running from it. I, I, I remember when evangelist John Arcobio was with us. I mean, Brother Arcobio, he went down the line. He was giving everybody a word from God. He gave everybody a word from God. He gave Pastor a word from God. He gave Sister Beverly a word from God. He gave Kathy a word from God. Double joy. Still don't know what that means. Thank God it wasn't twins. I mean, he just, he just went down the line. He, he gave everybody a word from God. Except me. And I remember we get home that night, and I was talking to Kathy, and I was like chuckling. I said, yeah, I didn't get a word. Got no word. So we're laughing. She said, well, you got to take him to the airport tomorrow. <laughs> maybe you'll get a, maybe get a word on the way to the airport. So, man, I took Brother Okoyo to the airport. I carried his bags right to security. I mean, if they hadn't let me, I would have chased him right out on the tarmac. No word from God. Sometimes you're going to have to navigate life without a word from God. You know what the word from God is? When you don't have a word from God, the word of God is worship. The word of God is have an, embrace an attitude of thanksgiving. Get an attitude of praise. Have an attitude that says, I'm thankful for what God has done. I'm, God, you're good. God, you're great. God, you're merciful. God, you're powerful. God, you're a healer. I, I know I haven't got my healing yet, but I'm thanking you that you're a healer. I, I'm grateful that you're a deliverer. I haven't got my deliverance yet, but you're a delivering God. I just got an attitude of thanksgiving and it's something amazing happens when we embrace thankfulness. God just kind of reaches in to the situation and that situation turns around and releases us into God's promise and God's power and God's potential. It's here this morning. It's here. How do you know it's here? I know it's here because we all have it. It's just a matter of us embracing an attitude of gratitude and thanking God in the middle of the storm, thanking God in the middle of the trial, thanking God in the middle of the good time, thanking God in the middle of the blessing, thanking God despite whatever's going on, good or bad. Why? Because there's an attitude of thanksgiving. There's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Every one of us have got it. It's right here. If you'll just let it out, you've got it. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it right here. You've got it right now. You just got to release it and give it to God this morning. So where are the nine this morning? The nine, don't get discouraged if it's circumstance. Don't get disheartened. Don't get distracted if it's a lot of stuff left to do on the to-do list. I'm saying nine, would you come? Would you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God? Because God can turn everything around. Here's the thing, final point. That one that went back to worship. The one that returned. Jesus said, your whole. The rest were relying on a priest for his blessing, his approval. If they had just gone back, that would have been an unnecessary trip. Jesus made them whole. I've heard people say that maybe they were missing digits or mims because of the horror of that disease and that Jesus made them whole. I don't know if literally limbs grew, fingers grew. I don't know. I don't know if that was what changed him from his friends. I, 
I'm not sure. I'm not certain. I, I don't understand the Greek. I, I did a little bit of research, so I, I'm not calm. I don't know this morning. I'm just telling you, I don't know. But maybe, maybe, it may be that Jesus made him every bit whole. And he was different because he had an attitude of gratitude. But here's what I know. If the nine had returned with the one and said, ah, you're right, you're right. We've got to go back and thank Jesus. That they would have been made whole. Today, God wants to bring wholeness in this room. I wasn't going to open the altar, but I think I will this morning. It's 10 after 12. I'm finished. But I'd like for someone to come with an attitude of thanksgiving today. It's a, it's a challenge. It's, it's the challenge that we're, we're submitting this morning that if you have a grateful heart, if you have a thankful heart, if you have a sacrifice of thanksgiving, you don't want to contain it. You don't want to just kind of hold on to it. If you want to release it to God and watch what God does with that thanksgiving, I'm inviting you to come. This is just, there's nothing special about this area except that it does define a position that you take and a step that you're willing to make in the direction of God going further with you in life. So I'm encouraging you this morning that this may represent Thanksgiving Sunday, but beyond that, it represents tomorrow and next month. I'm inviting you to come. You can come right now. That's perfect. I'm wondering if someone, I don't, I, I, I'm not trying to draw this line and put bad people on one side and good people on the other. I'm just looking for someone that's thankful this morning. I'm looking for someone that says, I, I, I'm, I've got gratefulness in my life. I'm I've got gratitude for the goodness of God. I'm thankful for how he's moved. I'm, I haven't seen everything that God is able to do yet, but I'm going to trust him this morning. I wish you just let that praise out for a moment. Come on, with the loud voice. Glorify God with a loud voice. Thank Him for His great mercy. With a loud voice, celebrate His greatness, His goodness. With a loud voice this morning, declare His omnipotence, what God's able to do. Jesus. Why don't we just sing this song together? I think about the love. Oh, yeah. How he saved me. How he saved me. How he 